May the Lord give you his peace. My name is Father David Mary of Our Lady of Sorrows, and I welcome you back to our third class on baptism. Uh, either you yourself are preparing to be baptized, or you're getting ready to baptize your child, or maybe you're a godparent ready to be the godparent of a kid to be baptized. Or maybe you just want to renew your own faith in your own baptism, renew your understanding of this beautiful treasure, this beautiful gift that we received from our Lord Jesus Christ. This baptism, which is so amazing and so incredible, and its fruits and, and its workings in our lives are so amazing that we really need to take the time to sit down and go through it carefully to see just what God does, is doing, and wants to do in our souls. And so welcome back to our third class. In this uh, class, we will examine the fruits of the sacrament of baptism, or the effects of the sacrament of baptism. What exactly happens when the child is baptized? What happened to us when we were baptized? What will happen to your baby when your baby is baptized? And as we said, baptism is more than a ceremony. It's more than just a nice little thing we do when their baby is in the church. It's more than just a welcoming ceremony into the church. It's more than just an initiation, as if it was some sort of initiation into a sorority or a fraternity. There is an initiation, but it's far more than just an initiation. So many beautiful things happen in the soul that it's, it's incredible. And we need to look at that so when we approach the waters of baptism, or think back on our own baptisms, we have greater joy and a greater beautiful understanding of what's happening. So if we can roll up the curtain between heaven and earth, if we can actually see what takes place in the soul on a spiritual level and see what happens at the moment of baptism when that water strikes that person's head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, if we could see what was happening, we'd be knocked off our feet. Perhaps it would be so beautiful and so incredible and so glorious that we would just die from sheer joy of what we see taking place in that person's soul. At the moment of baptism, the moment of baptism, every grace that Christ won for us on the cross is given to us. If you think of that baby being brought forward to be baptized, and as the water is being poured on the child's head in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, every grace from the cross is flowing onto that child. And things are happening in that child's soul. We don't see it, but we know by faith what's happening in that child's soul. It's so amazing and so incredible that we would be blown away if we could actually see it taking place. You know, we talked about how our first parents sold us into the slavery of sin, that they were created in original justice, they fell into sin, we were born into this world of original sin with all these defects, and it was Christ Jesus who in becoming man through the Blessed Virgin Mary took upon himself the sins of the world offered himself in sacrifice for us, died, rose, ascended, and then sent the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us divine life. And we saw that how through the sacraments, that divine life is given to us. And so the grace of divine life that Christ achieved for us on the cross is given to us at the moment of baptism. So as I pour the water over the person's head to be baptized three times, these are the effects of the soul. And I'm going to give you 11 of them, okay? So get a pen and paper out and take down these 11 effects on the soul. First, the stain of original sin is washed away, which is why we use water. There's a washing of the soul. That stain that was on our sin from our first parents is washed from our soul. So the first grace, the grace of original sin being washed from our soul. Secondly, a second thing, an indelible mark is made upon the soul. An indelible mark. Now, an indelible mark means it can't be washed away. It can't fade away. It won't go away. It can't be taken away. It's indelible. It is there for all of eternity. If you go to the glory of the kingdom of heaven, that mark stays on your soul. If you wind up in hell for all of eternity, that mark is in your soul. It's like a shepherd who brands his sheep and says, this one's mine. 
or a cow, cattle rancher. Branding is cattle. They're his. They belong to him. When we were baptized, our souls were marked with an indelible mark, and we belong to Christ. When we go with the baptismal liturgy, we'll do this in a very uh, significant way as we make the sign of the cross over the child's head, and I say, I claim you for Christ. I claim the child for Christ at the moment of baptism, and an indelible mark is made on the soul. There are three sacraments that mark the soul forever, that make that indelible mark. The first is baptism, the second is confirmation, and the third is priesthood. These are the three sacraments that can't be repeated. Why? Because once given, always given. They're there forever. So you can't get rebaptized. You can't get reconfirmed. It can't be reordained. Because when we're validly baptized, validly confirmed, validly ordained, that is forever. An indelible mark is made upon the soul. Okay? So, uh, let's see. Let's talk about third. Okay, so our third one here. So we have the uh, stained original sin washed away, the indelible mark made on the soul, and now our third one is we're brought into the state of grace. We get be given the state of grace. So as that mark has been on our soul, original sin is washed away, we are given the state of grace. That's the third effect. Fourth effect, and this is pretty awesome. At the moment of baptism, we become truly and really adopted children of God. Now, we're all children of God by creation, when we're born into this world. So your little baby about to be baptized is a child of God by creation, but when they go into the waters of baptism, they become a child of God by adoption. They become adopted by God. Adopted as His own children. And not an adoption in paperwork, but an adoption in the blood of Christ. Although it's the waters of baptism washing upon their child's soul, it's the blood of Christ that won for them, the spilling of Christ's blood on Calvary, that won for them redemption. And so they become adopted children of God. Your child will be capable of calling God Father, Abba, and mean it. It's through the graces of baptism that we truly become adopted children of God and can call God Abba. The child will grow as God's adopted son or daughter. Your child will grow as an adopted son and daughter of God, the Father. And think about how that can radically alter your relationship with God. Once we understand that we have been adopted by God, by God's choosing us for Himself, choosing to adopt us, so loving us that He wanted us to be His children, how powerfully that could change our relationship with God knowing that God has adopted us as our, His own. Okay, so that's the fourth one. The fifth one. St. Paul says if we are children of God by adoption, we are therefore heirs. Heirs to a kingdom. So St. Paul says, if God the Father is God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and we have become His adopted children, then we ourselves become heirs to that kingdom. We are princes and princesses, heirs to a kingdom. Jesus even says that he wishes to give us the glory he received from the Father. So beautifully, in the gift of the state of grace, in the gift of the waters of baptism, not only do we become children of God, we become heirs to the kingdom of heaven. That is our inheritance. As heirs to that kingdom of heaven, we are citizens of that kingdom. That's why Christians see themselves on pilgrimage here on earth. We're citizens of two worlds, citizens of two nations. The nation of this world, but we're also citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And in the end, it is the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven that's really going to matter. Okay? So that's the fifth one. We become heirs to the kingdom of heaven. The sixth grace of the sacrament, or the effect of the sacrament, fruit of the sacrament, is that we are wedded to Christ. We are wedded to Christ. Now remember, Jesus says that it's why, God, uh, why a man shall leave his father's house and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, in the waters of baptism, we are united to Christ. We become one flesh with Christ. 
We're wedded, our souls are wedded to him, which is why we put little babies in wedding gowns. Because it is a wedding day for the soul to be wedded to Christ Jesus. Then the two become one flesh. The two become one. So because the two are bound together, we go to our seventh one. Because the two are bound, the baptized, wedded to Christ, becomes part of the body of Christ the church. Through the wedding, through the marriage of the soul of that person with Christ, we become members of the body of Christ the church. So much so that Jesus sees us as his own body. Think about this. When Saul was out there, he was persecuting Christians and so forth. The Lord knocks him off his horse and the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You touch Christians, you touch Christ because Christians are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ and we have become members of that body of Christ through the beautiful gift of this marriage of ourselves to Christ Jesus at baptism. Now, number eight, being wedded to Christ and becoming one body with him, we receive the gift of being grafted onto the vine. Now, Jesus said at the Last Supper, I am the vine, you are the branches, the Father is the vine dresser, right? So picture a vine growing and picture you as a branch and you're grafted onto the vine. What happens? All the life that you now receive, all the nutrition you receive, comes through that vine. And then you are nourished and strengthened through what comes from the vine to you, the branch, and then you produce the fruits. And so part of baptism, what takes place in baptism, is that we're grafted onto Christ through the church. We become one with Him, and all the nourishment, all the spiritual nourishment we now receive comes through us through Christ Jesus. Particularly, this will be most important when we talk about Holy Eucharist, but we're nourished by Christ. And the Lord then expects us in our life with Him as we grow and mature to produce the fruits of the Spirit, of which St. Paul tells us there's 12 fruits of the Spirit. The more we live in union with Christ Jesus and the deeper we live with Christ, we begin to produce the fruits of the Spirit. Charity, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, generosity, patience, perseverance, self-control, modesty, and chastity. These are all fruits of the Holy Spirit. The more we live in Christ and the closer we are to Him, the more we unite with Him, the more we allow Him to feed us with His own divine life, the more we produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the happier we are. Number nine. Among all these gifts, we also receive the great gift of becoming the dwelling place of the Most Holy Trinity. The Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make their home within us. The human person receives the indwelling of the Most Blessed Trinity. Think about God, the Most Blessed Trinity, dwelling within you. The baptized person receives this indwelling. The baptized person is now sacred, consecrated, made holy, so much so that God dwells in that person. The beautiful gift of the indwelling of the most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a beautiful gift of giving your child baptism, of allowing your child to become a dwelling place of God here in this earth or you yourself come into the waters of baptism, how much you are loved by God to become the dwelling place of God. We're already baptized. Think of your dignity as one already baptized. If living in the state of grace, you are a dwelling place of the Most High, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How awesome. So to say you are a temple of God is not just a metaphor. After baptism, it is a truth. Paul, when correcting people about their immorality, he would say, Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Why do we respect and reverence our bodies and those of others? Because they're temples of God. God has made his dwelling among men. Number 10. Along with these gifts, we also receive the infused gifts of what we call the three theological virtues. So when you were baptized, 
when you're about to be baptized, your child is about to be baptized, three particular gifts are given, theological virtues that are infused into the soul of the person. Hope, faith, and charity. Or hope, faith, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Right? These three gifts are given to the baptized so that they can live the Christian life. They can live in faith, knowing God and knowing the things of God, hoping in God, holding firm to the promises of God, knowing that God keeps His promises in that sure and certain hope. Love, fulfilling the twofold commandment of loving God, God, one's whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and being able to love one neighbor as oneself. These three theological virtues are infused in the soul at the moment of baptism, of faith, hope, and love, so that we could fulfill the commands of our Lord and live lives of faith, live lives of hope, live lives of love. We should always be asking, Lord, to increase our faith, increase our hope, increase our love. That we be given right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Now, finally, at baptism, this is number 11, at baptism, the baptized is given the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit that allow the person to live a holy life and to overcome the fallen state that we were born into, to live lives of virtue, to reach blessedness, to overcome sin and become saints. Now I know if you were in catechism class growing up, you'd say, oh gee, Father, isn't it confirmation the time we're given the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit? No. You were given the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit at baptism. At confirmation, these sevenfold gifts of the Spirit are increased and confirmed and strengthened, but they were already given at baptism. Is why it's so important to receive confirmation because they do need to be strengthened, they do need to be um, increased and so forth within us, which happens at confirmation, completing the sacrament of baptism. But sevenfold gifts of the Spirit are given to us so that we can live contrary to that fallen state. So God gives four gifts to our intellect knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and counsel. You think about the darkened intellect that happened when our first parents sinned. They were born to the state of original sin with the darkened intellect. Well, to undo that, to correct that, that her inheritance we had from our first parents, the Lord gives us the gift of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and counsel. And now to our will that's been weakened, the Lord gives the gift of fortitude to work against concupiscence. That inclination to evil, we want to do the evil thing, we want to do the wrong thing, we know we shouldn't, we're inclined to do it, and the gift of the Holy Spirit of fortitude gives us the strength to say, no, I'm not going to sin, I'm going to choose holiness of life, I'm going to act in virtue, I'm not going to act in sinfulness. And so fortitude gives us that strength that allows us to choose the right thing. It also allows us to bear all sufferings and unite them to Christ that fortitude to persevere and allow all our sufferings to be transformed in Christ. See, because we're baptized into Christ Jesus, everything we endure, all sufferings that we endure, that we experience because we live in a fallen world, we can now take those sufferings that we endure, whether they're mental sufferings, physical sufferings, spiritual sufferings, we can take them and unite them to Christ because we're united to Christ we can unite them to Christ and offer them to the Father. And say, Father, I offer these sufferings that I'm going through, these mental sufferings, emotional sufferings, spiritual sufferings, physical sufferings, whatever they may be. I unite them to the cross of Christ Jesus and I offer them to you for grace for so-and-so, for help for so-and-so. And then we just become like this rain cloud of grace upon the world, uniting our sufferings to Christ and therefore bringing it down. The gift of fortitude at baptism gives us the ability to do that and strength. And then of course piety and fear of the Lord are given to our hearts so that these two gifts help us to grow in a deep relationship with God. To truly be pious, persons of prayer, the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray. It's 
It's very important to teach your children to praise the Holy Spirit can work with them as they grow and mature, to be truly pious, to truly have fear of the Lord, that reverence for the Lord, to actually honor Him with how we speak, how we live, how we behave at Mass, how we carry ourselves, that fear of the Lord is given. And as your child grows, they're going to need your instruction to help them to learn how to use these gifts that God gives them. So all seven gifts will be renewed and strengthened when the baptized person receives confirmation. So to sum everything all up, we know why it is so important to have your child baptized as soon as possible. Think about it. God wants to give your child all these things. If you're not baptized, God wants to give you all these things. If you are baptized, God has given you all these things. If you're in the state of mortal sin, God wants to bring you back into the state of grace and restore all these things to you. God so loves us that he bestows all these graces upon us. That's why it's important to move forward with baptism as soon as possible. Would you want your child being deprived of any of these graces? Would you want to be deprived of any of these graces? If we're in the state of mortal sin, do we really want to go through life without all these graces? It's so important, the beautiful gift of baptism, so that we can truly live good and holy lives in this world. So once again, when the person is baptized, these are the graces given. Go with them real quick. One, the state of original sin is washed away. Two, an indelible mark is made on the soul. Three, we're brought into the state of grace. Four, we're adopted as God's children. Five, we become heirs to the kingdom of heaven, citizens of heaven. Six, the soul is wedded to Christ. Seven, we become members of the body of Christ. Eight, we're grafted onto the vine of Christ, the church. Nine, we become a dwelling place of the temple of the blessed trinity. Ten, the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity are infused into our souls. And eleven, the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit are bestowed upon us. What a grace. What a gift. What an awesome God we have. All these things will be yours when you come to the waters of baptism. All these things will be that of your child when your child is brought to the waters of baptism. All these were given to you when you were baptized. All these things will be restored to you when you come back to the sacrament of confession. What a great and awesome God we have. What a God of mercy. What a God who wants nothing more than for us to enjoy the fullness of his own glory. In our next class, we'll discuss the baptismal liturgy and we'll walk through it slowly, part by part, and see uh, what exactly takes place at baptism, why we use what we use, why we do what we do, and uh, we'll walk through all of that and explain as we come through it all. May God bless you and Mary keep you.